Hi there, everybody. Today I wanted to talk about a fantasy book, uh, fantasy series, not Malazan today. Malazan is, of course, my favorite fantasy series, but um, one of my other favorite fantasy series is this one. It's uh, by Tad Williams. Uh, it's called Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. You know, it's one of my favorite fantasy series of all time. It's it's just so good, and I thought maybe just talking about it a little bit, maybe could give some encouragement to some people to check it out, maybe if they haven't read it before, or if you have read it before and you really liked it, maybe this can just be a nice chance to reminisce, a little bit of nostalgia. Uh, really is a great series, really kind of had a big effect on me in my history of reading fantasy books. It was a really important turning point for the kinds of fantasy books I was into. So, You know, it's a it's a really particular thing for people like the books, um, fantasy or whatever. Our favorite books they always kind of come into our lives at certain times, certain places, certain points in our experience, and it it really connects with us in an individual way when it's our favorite. So you know, you can't necessarily replicate that kind of experience, but uh, I think it, it does definitely hold up. I read it a few times. Um, once when I was more of a teenager and then once more uh, in my 20s. And I think it got better the second time. So, you know, it's not just a pure nostalgia thing. It does it does definitely hold up. It's 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 just so good. Um, so let's let's give a little bit of a look back to this great series. I'll just talk about why I liked it so much. And maybe maybe it's something you'll want to check out. I don't see too many people talking about it. Um, I I think it's maybe even, I kind of hate to use this word, but maybe it's kind of underrated compared to some of the other big doorstopper fantasy series. So, where do I want to start here? Well, when I was younger, I was really into, like, this is maybe the fourth or fifth grade when I started reading fantasy books, and I was really into um, kind of the cheaper, pulpier kind of fantasy books like Dragonlance stuff and Forgotten Realms. I was really into that stuff. That was kind of my gateway into fantasy novels. But eventually, of course, you're going to start looking for other stuff. Like You just like fantasy books and you want to read more of them. You want to read more of these stories, get into more of these worlds. And so there was a point where you transition into, I guess, more of these mature, bigger, more epic, more um, books with better literary quality. Um, so this was one of those first big, more mature series I, I read. And um, it's kind of weird how I came across it because a lot of the like adults in my life... Uh, they kind of frowned upon the whole fantasy book thing. They thought it was kind of cheap, escapist literature. Of course, most parents and adults encourage reading, but um, at least for my experience growing up a lot of times, uh, they thought I was kind of maybe not making the best use of my time with some of these uh, fantasy books. But um, I remember there was a friend of... Uh, there was a friend of the family. We visited their house one time. And I forget what I was reading, but um, the lady there, she said, uh, she said, oh, you like fantasy books, huh? Well, I like fantasy books. I've, I've got a whole bunch of fantasy books. Uh, let, me, let me give you some. And I thought, what? You're going to give me some fantasy books? So she, she had all these books I'd never heard of. And... It was cool that she was just interested in kind of spreading the love that way and um, just giving me some of her old secondhand books. And um, she said, this one, this, Dragon Boat Chair. And at the time, the second book had come out in paperback. And she said, oh, you're just, this series is so, so good. It's the best series, best fantasy series I've read. And when you get to the second book, you're going to be just sad that it's over and you have to wait for the next one. I thought, oh, wow, that sounds pretty interesting. Um, so she hooked me up with uh, this old, old paperback coffee. Uh, and 
there you go there that's that's kind of how it started so it's sort of weird she she also gave me tad williams first novel and this was actually um where i started with tad williams he's done a lot of other uh series but he started with this funny little book uh called tail chaser song sorry it's not really a funny book it's actually a serious book it's about cats uh they're talking cats and they go on like this adventure um tail chaser song uh i think it was a relatively successful interesting book kind of lovable um but uh like this is just this is just kind of a fun nice little adventure book and it it's a standalone thing uh pretty good pretty worth reading if you haven't read it before but didn't prepare me for uh dragon bone chair and memory sorrow and thorn by any means and in fact i would say this book despite its appearance was maybe a little over my head at the time like in grade six or uh something when i was trying to read some of this stuff you know i had read um i had taken a stab at lord of the rings and thought it was pretty good but maybe i was just a little too young to kind of like really appreciate it um of course it's it's great it's legendary um but i couldn't totally appreciate it at the time and when i came to dragon bone chair this was another like big doorstop or fantasy book that i was going to try because i had uh i had one of those big uh three-in-one omnibus lord of the rings books and to me that was like the really big step up from the pulpy fantasy books i was reading but you know i didn't even really like the hobbit when i was a kid i kind of just didn't the magic didn't work for me lord of the rings i liked more but still i felt like i didn't totally appreciate what was going on there so when i came to dragon bone chair i think i was a little bit young at the time too because the first time i read it uh i only made it to i think about 200 pages basically when i'll talk about the story more in a moment but um about 200 or maybe 250 pages in you know things start to get real the uh, the crisis hits and the action starts to kind of happen um or things start to get kind of dire and dark for our main character uh he escapes from this castle and he kind of goes off and uh, wanders around a forest and and i think i just kind of fizzled out like uh the book takes its time the literary quality was way better than what i was used to um it's uh starts with kind of the, the slow burn going on and it was just hard to wrap my head around at the time i think i was just premature getting into it so then I read some other stuff, you know, like Wheel of Time. I, I really liked that at the time and some of these other kind of bigger fantasy books. But I came back to Dragon Bone Chair a few weeks later, no, a few years later. And that first 200 pages that like didn't really capture my imagination the first time. Um, this time it worked and I was getting into it. it. It sets up a lot of lore and kind of history and setting up the world and almost in the time of a whole like forgotten realms or dragonlance book um you're getting like the setup for this book so uh much meatier in terms of content and density of um what's happening and all the setup and stuff so now i was again more of a mature reader i could kind of absorb that and appreciate what was going on and and it still starts you know a little bit slow because there is quite a bit of setup but uh, my interest was a lot more hooked and then and then like i said there's this part where the character um things get bad he has to escape from the castle and he kind of goes out and his big adventure starts and i was into it it was good and and you just get more and more into it more and more hooked and uh just sucked in it like took over my whole imagination and boom ultimately one of the best series i ever read so well what is this series about um in a way it might not sound too interesting it might sound kind of cliche you've got you know a boy uh he's like a servant guy in a castle um he's got the hots for the princess maybe um he gets acquainted with this uh wise kind of doctor guy in the castle who starts teaching him a bunch of stuff and there's some dark stuff that's going on in the castle like the king dies and um, the shady son one of the sons who's the shady one he's kind of in cahoots with this 
very shady priest. Um, and they kind of uh, take over the throne and, you know, um, that's sort of the start of how things start to go. But then ultimately it, it turns into this quest to get like three magic swords and defeat this ancient enemy called the Storm King, who's who's basically kind of like the the undead leader of what you would think of as kind of ice elves, like these evil elves from the north. There's like the dark elves, but they're like ice elves. Uh, they're called the Norns. And there's other elves. They're more like the forest elves, I guess you'd say. They're the equivalent for the series. They use different names. But um, And our main character, Simon, he, he just gets kind of caught up in this big adventure to uh, restore order, kind of save the world. And it involves this quest to get these three swords, three magic swords. So you know, might sound kind of cliche. Um, he's got kind of this, this special destiny. Um, gets these interesting different characters that he gets um, involved with. Big adventure. Um, and, and yeah, so, I, I mean, I'm saying, I've been saying it's kind of like more of a mature fantasy book compared to what I was reading for the most part uh, before that. And by mature, like, when it's about a, a kid or a teenager who goes on an adventure, you know, this isn't like a Harry Potter book. This this was more of, like, an adult-oriented book. And I don't mean, like, Game of Thrones, like, a lot of, like, R-rated kind of stuff. Although, it you know, it, it would be equivalent of R-rated, I guess. Um, but it's just a great series about kind of growing up, coming to maturity, going on this epic adventure. And, like, cool stuff happens. They go to cool places. Um monsters magic swords ancient castles ancient dungeons um evil dark elves from the north um it's just great and you know it doesn't feel cliche uh you can see kind of elements of history um that williams was inspired by or influenced by and different kind of fantasy stuff but he just puts it together in like this perfect package the characters are so strong the the writing is so good uh he's the literary quality of Tad Williams was, I think, um, way better than what I was reading at the time, like compared to, of course, pulpy kind of fantasy books. Um, but, you know, better than stuff like Wheel of Time or uh, what else? I don't know. But he's still one of my favorite fantasy authors because he was he was just a really good writer, like the kind of description and evocative stuff that happens and um, you know, those feelings of desperation and excitement and mystery and wonder. It's just a really great fantasy series. So, first book, Dragonbone Chair. I mean, I've got this old paperback copy from this lady who gave this to me. And these, there used to be a lot of these, uh, I don't know what you call this, like these weird window covers and paperback books. Um, you know, you kind of open it up and you get an image. Um... I don't know, kind of cheesy, but kind of fun. Mine's basically pretty decrepit. I had to use some masking tape to keep it intact. But, um, yeah, pretty good. There's some quotes in here. It says, A grand fantasy on a scale approaching Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Very fair. And then the fancy equivalent of War and Peace. Also a fair uh, quote. Good lines. Good uh, little review um, blurbs. So, um what do I want to say here? Um, so the first book, again, it, it starts relatively slow, but once he gets out of the castle and meets up with some other characters and the adventure gets rolling, they figure out what they have to do to kind of f defeat or fight the evil guys. And, and then cool stuff starts happening, especially at, at towards the end of this book, like some crazy stuff starts going down and, and just the stakes get so much higher and like that feeling of desperation gets way crazier. There's like this crisis and, um, you know, there's a point where things really get serious and I'm almost getting kind of goosebumps thinking about it because it was so cool and intense and it was just so riveted by it. Um, and, and our main character, Simon, he's on this just great adventure and it has this really great climax and you're just like aching for the next book at that point. So good. Um, kind of bonus thing to mention. I thought it was cool uh, how they had sort of the glossary or like the big list of characters 
um, pronunciation guides, uh, just little things that you could refer to to help you kind of get into the world so they don't, the characters don't have to like stop and explain things to the reader like you're stupid, like you need lots of ex exposition. It kind of counts on you to go into the glossary at the back, learn some pronunciation. Um, I think the guide to pronunciation is actually a really nice thing to have in a fantasy book. Um, sometimes we never really know how some of these words and names are supposed to be pronounced. But you got creatures, you got things, characters, places. Very handy. Every fantasy book should really have that kind of stuff. I'm surprised it's not more common. Like Wheel of Time had stuff like that. Um, anyhow, so the second book comes up then. Uh, the second book is so, so good. And it's a, you know, classic kind of in-between book. But um, because it's kind of coming out of the really wild, crazy, intense, epic stuff that happened at the second book, it, it really begins with a bang. Oh, it's upside down. So this is the second book. I've got it in hardcover. None of this stuff is um, not great for collection because it's all different kind of style, but, um, or different formats I've got. But... You know, this is what I've got. So this one's Stone of Farewell, the second book. Stone of Farewell is kind of this destination um, some of the characters have to get to for reasons you can learn about. But like I said, whereas the first book, of course, starts a little slower setting things up. This one begins with a bang. There's a lot of action. Uh, you're really sucked in right away. And then it, you know, kind of slows down. It's working things out, setting things up for um later on but the quest is continuing remember they're trying to get these three swords um and we're also kind of um getting kind of the different point of view characters kind of set up because um the groups are s kind of splitting up at the end of the first book and now there's some other split ups i mean it's been so long since i've read it i don't remember exactly how it goes down but this book is just i mean so good and i think the writing quality improved a lot uh so good such a great book and i remember this lady giving um me the whole kind of lowdown on the series and and this was the new one at the time and she said you know it's just gonna hurt when you're done this book because you're waiting for the third one by this time of course the third one had come out for me so it wasn't so much of an issue i could go right to book three and book three is amazing now might seem like a bit of a misnomer but it is a trilogy the thing is though when book three came out um in paperback it was just so big they had to split it into two uh so there's the first one to green angel tower part one second one to green angel tower part two and if you've read fantasy books before uh, you know, a lot of times the journey is a lot better than the destination and, and sometimes the endings are just kind of okay or they fall a little flat. Like it's just hard to wrap things up in that super satisfying way. Um, Green Angel Tower is an amazing conclusion. Um, and there's still a lot of stuff that happens kind of building up to that conclusion because between the two, you're talking like, I don't know, 1500, 1600 pages. Maybe it's, it's a monster third book or two third books if you will and um and and there's this amazing really cool really good twist that happens very late in the book and it kind of changes things that you're expecting and and when this happens you're like oh no like how are they going to get out of this what are they going to do now and this was before like internet where you could go just read synopsis of books or you could um, run into spoilers all over the place by accident and just ruin things. Um, you know, I was going in fresh. I didn't know anyone who had ever read the third book. Um, and that, that twist at the end, close to the end, where they have to kind of readjust their plans a little bit and kind of figure out a new approach, if you will. I won't, of course, spoil anything now. But it was so good, and and like you kind of miss that feeling sometimes nowadays because unless you're careful, it's it's pretty easy to get things spoiled by accident. And and now also, I mean, it seems like everything's got to have a big twist in it, um, and it's almost kind of contrived sometimes. But this really felt really organic and um, and brilliant the way it was done, and I didn't see it coming at all. Maybe. Um, 
maybe, I mean, there is a little bit of foreshadowing, but it's, I don't know, I think it was really, really well done. It doesn't uh, telegraph it too strongly. So basically, this just blindsided me. It was awesome. It was a really cool experience, and, and I hope if you read it, you just avoid any kind of foreknowledge about what happens um, because I hope you can have that same experience where the twist is really cool and exciting. Um, so anyway, it's great. It's it's just so good. The writing quality is so good. And, and, and again, it has this... Uh, I really like stories that are about kind of growing up. Um, and our main character, he doesn't grow up that much in terms of age, but he comes to maturity. Like he goes on this adventure, he gets involved in basically a war that's going down uh, at the end and he's involved in a battle and stuff. And, um, you know, he, he loses in his innocence, but he's still a hero. Like he, uh, he's scared. He's um, very flawed character, but, um, he steps up and he does what needs to be done and he struggles with some things and, and it's just, he's a great character, Simon, our main guy. And, you know, the quest for the three swords, how does that pan out? Do they defeat the, the evil new king? Do they defeat the priest? Do they, def uh, that evil priest guy, do they defeat the storm king? Like, how does it all go down? It's just, it's so, so, so good. Um, Maybe not the best use of language, so, so good. But what else can I say? I mean, it's been quite a few years since I last read it, but so great. And the second time I read it, like, later from my teenage years, um, in earlier mid-20s, I read it again and held up so well. It was better than before. It was kind of fun reading it through, knowing how it all pans out. Because, you know, you're watching for things and um, you can see different hints and clues and how... Uh, well, he sets things up and how he weaves all the lore together. Uh, so good. So I would strongly, strongly recommend this series, of course. If you haven't read it, you know, give it a chance. Um, and if you, if you think it starts a little slow, you know, be patient. Uh, a lot of people who have maybe watched some of my other videos about Malazan, you know, those are massive tank books. And they're not boring, but, you know, they are slow sometimes, if that makes sense. Like, there's always stuff happening. Same thing kind of here. Like, um, but the series starts maybe with you needing a little bit of patience. But I think it's about 200 pages in where things really start to escalate. Um, and... Then it's pretty great and then kind of the story starts coming together they get kind of their main objective uh you get like a team of dudes together who are going to form a party and they're going to go on a sweet adventure and it's it's great they go to cool places they fight monsters uh there's dark magic so on the magic thing like magic is super super rare it's uh not what do, what do people say like a low magic or high magic setting i don't know uh, do I even remember what those mean? Anyway, there's not a lot of people with magic in this. Um, like, the priest kind of has some magic, and that makes him a really big deal, because um, there's not, like, a whole bunch of wizards running around, like, in Forgotten Realms or something. Like, it's rare, it's mysterious, it's kind of scary. kind of has, like, this dark aspect to it. Um, and... I don't know. Lore-wise, I won't get into it too much. Like, I, I don't really want to explain it. You, that's kind of up to you. You can look into it. Just watch out for spoilers. But just dive into it. Check it out. Pick up Dragon Boat here. Give it a try. It's it's so good. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this video, uh, and I'll just mention this maybe before I wrap up here, but there's a sequel series to this that Tad Williams has been working on. And I believe the fourth book comes out this summer. So I'm Mm, talking in May 2024, I'm pretty sure the fourth book comes out later this year, maybe summer or something. Uh, so there's a sequel to this series. I have not read this sequel series yet, but I'm pretty excited to do so. Uh, I've just been not in a big rush because I'm waiting for the fourth book and whatever. Uh, i got lots of other stuff to read in the meantime. 
but there is a new series. I think it's called The Last King of Austin Ard. Austin Ard is the name of the land or the world. Um, and so I'm pretty excited to see how that pans out. I'm assuming it's going to be pretty good because Tad Williams has never really let me down. And perhaps worth mentioning as well, well, the new series is, uh, it's four books. So it's kind of like his science fiction series, Otherland, which was also, what do you say, tetralogy or quadrology. So this new one is also a four book series. Uh, not like, you know, the third book split in two, but I, th I think it's just genuinely, f uh, set up as four books, like some of his other stuff. He does have another fantasy series too. Uh, okay. I'm getting distracted. Um, there's a whole other fantasy series that he has. Um, the shadow ones shoot, I'm blanking out on what they're called, but they have shadow in all the titles and it's, it's really good. Um, different kind of thing. I, I definitely start with Dragon Boat Chair, but he has lots of other stuff. Maybe I can talk about that in some other video. Anyway, I'm, uh, I don't know, Dementia Moan. I'm all over the place. Hang on. So this new series, uh, it's going to be done. So that's cool. Um, but of course this is coming out decades after the original and, and the first one is perfectly, perfectly wrapped up. I don't even have a guess of what the new one is about, to be honest. Um, I really haven't read anything about it. I just go on the strength of Tad Williams' um, previous work, and I've bought it. I expect it to be good. Now, there's a few other books that are kind of interesting. I haven't read them, but I have picked them up. I've got them here. Oops, making a mess. Okay, so there's like a prequel. Um, I haven't read this. It's Brothers of the Wind. I think it's uh, about elves like the elf kind of characters of the series and i think this takes place like thousands of years before memory sorrow and thorn uh i assume it's good it's sure it's not like a doorstopper book um very curious to kind of check this out because i, I do want to return to memory sorrow and thorn and maybe reread it before uh, i get to the new uh King of Austin Ard series, and of course I'd like to read this prequel book. And then there's there's some kind of in-between book. Uh, so this one's called The Heart of What Was Lost. I don't even know what this is about, but apparently this takes place between the original main series, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, and the new Last King of Austin Ard series. Again, just a little guy, pretty short. How many pages are in this? Not even 300 pages. And I think, I have the impression that it's also about the elf kind of characters, but I could be wrong. I honestly don't know. Don't take my word for it. You can look it up yourself. Um, so this might be kind of an interesting thing. It's just like, I don't know if you can see that. A, a novel of Austinard. That's the world. So, yeah, when this new series comes out, we're going to have kind of a super jumbo mega series to read if you put all these books together. And I'm pretty excited to do that, but... The main goal for today was to talk about how awesome Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn is. Uh, I've been kind of going off for a long time here, so I should wrap this up. Strongly recommended. Uh, maybe if you like the series as well and you've read it, um, maybe leave a comment about why you think it's awesome. And you can probably describe or explain better than I can, because this is a somewhat inarticulate, half-assed video uh, no editing, no scripting. I'm just going off the top of my head and wanted to share as best I can in this limited way how much I love this series. It was a really big deal to me growing up, but again, it's not just nostalgia. It was really good when I read it again many years later, and I really look forward to reading it a third time now. Uh, maybe in the next year or two, I'll get back into it. Uh, so... Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. 10 out of 10. One of the best fantasy series of all time. Hope you enjoy it. Hope this video was somewhat interesting. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.